Yeah, for, first and foremost, the win. I'm about to close on a duplex, and that's door number four and five. And that's all happened within you guys starting this, you know, just let's go taking action. What's up, you guys? We just finished Ask Alex number 58. And this was one of my favorite webinars because on the weeks when we do these virtual networking events, we just get to connect with everybody. Alex, what were some of the biggest takeaways from the group? Oh, man, there was big takeaways at today's webinar and meetup. Uh, and number one, I would say we talked about how to properly insure some of your investment projects. We talked about um, some of the wins from the tribe. So there was plenty of people that had bought some property or got the contract. So that was inspirational, right? And then we also talked about something very important, which is how to manage rehabs. So to check out those details, watch the webinar. Let's go. What's up, everybody? We're just about to get uh, launched off here. Probably be a little bit of a lighter attendance today, simply because I think a lot of our deal makers and people that we uh, are looking at here will be at the mastermind in Vegas. You see here, my man, Will. What's up, everybody? We'll get started pretty quickly. Today, we're going to do a little bit more of an open format, right? We just get to know each other. The purpose of that of us doing that monthly is because it allows us to just you know, put 20, 30, 40 heads together and see how we can help each other out, see where everybody's at on their real estate investing journey um, and relative to ours. And then we can see how we can help you out uh, based on all the stuff that we uh, see is working for us, but also um, things that people in our circle, it's, you know, things that are not working. So we really want to analyze um, the KPIs, uh, you know, the metrics, the stuff for the business. What's up, my man, Will? I think he's in Vegas right now uh, at the first day of the uh, Future Flipper Mastermind. I'm sure he's enjoying himself over there. A ton of cool cats over there, savage investors. Oh, it looks like he's in the office. What's up, Mr. Camacho? Yes, sir. We are out here at the uh, the Future Flipper Mastermind uh, out here in Ryan's office. So pretty cool. I'll, uh, I'll give you guys a little view in here in a minute once we get things started. But uh, yeah, excited to be out here, Alex. I know this is our fifth mastermind and uh, definitely always learn a ton when we come out here and hang out with Ryan, right? Yeah, I mean, the puck is always moving. We're always uh, looking to grow the business, get better as investors, understand what's happening in the market. I think the best suited it's best done by being other people that are performing at a super high level and i think we've been really um fortunate to be around some of these just these people that are savages in the in the industry um and they're growing and uh, people of all levels so um i really find a lot of value and i talk about this often right will to peek into the lives and businesses of other people in uh the business that you respect it gives you a lot of value for how you might want to structure your life and business and not even just like, you know, obviously connecting with Ryan is cool. Like Ryan's a great mentor and, and you know, one of our, our coaches. Um, but like you, you, you know, pointed out there, Alex, like the people you meet here are also valuable. Like you're going to meet people outside of Ryan who are here at the Mastermind attending it as well that are going to be able to provide value to you later on, right? Yeah. Um, exactly. And it's almost the same as like in this group right now, like the 10, 15 of us that are in here today, like we can definitely provide value to each other as well, right? Yeah, we just need to see who's uh, dealing with what problem, what uh, challenges. That could be a mindset. That could be a resource thing. That could be, you know, funding a deal. That could be so many different things. Um, just get to that next step, right, um, the journey. So, yeah, why don't we jump in, dude? Um, I think, like I said, today will be maybe a little bit lighter because of, uh, you know, a lot of people being in the, uh, you know, over there in Vegas and I think uh, people getting the beginning of the year going. Um, what do we got to talk about, man? Yeah, I see about, you know, 15, 20 people here in, uh, in the office right now that are normally here on the webinar and they're all, you know, laughing out there in the other room. They're like, oh, Will's got to run. Um, but yeah, man, I, I mean, I would love to kind of get a quick update, Alex, from you. I know, you know, we're going to mastermind this week, but what's kind of been going on in, in your life the past week? Uh, well, just been um, jumping around Mexico. So I was in Guadalajara um, for New Year's and that first week. And then I jumped over uh, last Thursday over here to Mexico City, seeing this uh, technically the second time, but the first time I came. It was on a short layover. Didn't see much of the city, especially a, a, a size, you know, a city this size. Um, got to hang out with a couple of real estate investors. One that I saw, I met at the Bigger Pockets conference this year, or I'm sorry, last year, and he's doing syndications, basically living in Mexico City, and then syndicating buying apartment buildings in Texas uh, with a variety of uh, different investors from Mexico, but also from um, the states. And so, um, great guy. Um, got to hang out with him and his partner. Um, also, um, another friend of mine, uh, back from the Hollywood days um, that you remember, uh, Nico, he's um, moved over here and he's selling a bunch of condos, just hustling and bustling over here. What up? What's up? And so, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, got to hang out with those guys, experience the city, hang out, have a great time there. Um, so 
I mean, not much else, man. It's the first, it's the second full week of 2022. So we are, you know, I think we closed on one property. We're definitely working on closing on a couple more uh, this month. And then um, also we figured out a couple of things uh, from the payment standpoint of things. I think it's been super valuable for our business, right? Well, where we're just like, as we're just buying more houses, so many payments, contractors, so many payments to vendors and the things just pile up. And then it takes up a lot of time, a lot of bandwidth. And we figure out a system by, and why? Because I went to a mastermind. I got to know this other investor and then he told me about it. And then he showed us how he's using it this e-check system. And now we're able to save a ton of time, which as we all know in this business, time is definitely valuable and time is money. Um, and I think we're just making a lot of progress on some of our deals. Um, our La Quinta property is in escrow right now. Looks like it, it might be a six figure payday. Um, a lot of people are gonna eat on that deal. Super happy on that one because we had a flood on it. We had an insurance claim on it. It was delayed, but the market was in our favor. And also the team rocked out and took care of business. And then also both of our Joshua Tree properties are making significant progress. Our Maui properties um, getting towards the finish line for the Burr. Uh, our big island properties moving forward rehab. And then my house hack in Hollywood is also looking great. Um, I think once I got that house hack done, well, Will, when we're negotiating, get the tenants out, and we get that property rehab, I'm going to be spending some more time in L.A., hanging with the team, uh, with the deal makers, hiking, uh, doing some more L.A. stuff. Um, I just don't have a permanent house there right now. So I think that's going to help out a lot. What do you think? Yeah, and again, you know, I mean, it's a testament to, you know, what we've been able to do this year. And, and uh, you know, when you close escrows and you open up other escrows, um, it, it shows that we're definitely putting the emphasis on, on this year, growing that Airbnb portfolio, right? Like, I think that's something that, you know, Alex is known as being a flipper, right? Like Alex the flipper, but, um, you know, the, the flipping mindset, we've always talked about this, Alex, like that's just a means to the end. Uh, it's a way to accumulate that capital, that you need to do those long-term goals. And so um, Airbnbs are one of our long-term goals because they can acquire capital for you very uh, easily and, and you know, a good amount of cash flow. So I think that's a, a part of the business that we're you know, excited to see us hit those goals as well for next year, right? Yeah, hell yeah. So everybody talks about it, man. We're, I'm, I'm not anti-cash flow. I just want to make as much possible so that I can keep as, much, as many as po uh, houses as possible. That's always been my formula, real simple. Flip as many houses as we can and so that way we can keep as many. I know it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, counterintuitive but it, it really starting to work that way now, right? We're, we're Now we're making enough profit where we're really forced to keep a more property and that's good for everybody, especially when we're keeping a pretty lean operation um, with the team, you know, some of them being remote and other people and most of the team members being tied directly to the profits of all the deals. I think our business model is kind of unique in that way, but we don't have a bunch of people just, you know, collecting a paycheck every couple of weeks. Like what we got out there, we got to eat what we kill. And uh, fortunately, you know, uh, we're a uh, team full of killers. Let's get it. There you go, man. Well, uh, you know, again, I, I think the update was uh, was awesome. It's a good outlook for the year. Uh, if you go ahead and make me host, Alex, what we do on these normally, guys, and, and what we'll go ahead and do again today is get everybody on the call uh, promoted in here to panelists. And, uh, you know, again, we want this call on this week to be about you guys and not so much about us. So we want to find out you know, from you guys, what's going on, what you guys need help with, what you guys are struggling with, things like that. So that, uh, you know, again, I, I consider this like a mini mastermind, right? Like there's, you know, 15, 20 heads in here. And, and we always talk about this on this call is, you know, 20 eyes are always better than, than two sets of eyes on it, right? So, you know, use this opportunity to, to learn from some other people and, and uh, get what you need accomplished, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, we started this uh, webinar slash meetup slash tribe uh, whatever you want to call it, like more than a year ago now, right, Will? And the premise was always the same. We're like, hey, how, let's get together. Let's talk about how we can help each other. Uh, we're working on this. What are you guys working on? And uh, there's no difference today where we're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, we sit down together for an hour. What's up, guys? What's going on? Um, I get a lot of questions. I get a lot of calls and things like that. Um, I can't answer all of them sometimes. And it's great to be able to just get with people here on this weekly um, meetup and say, what's up, guys? What's everybody up to? Um, who has some challenges, who has some wins, um, who has some big goals for 2022 they want to share. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is a little bit of everything. We're just hanging out virtually. Not quite in the metaverse, but we're hanging out. <laughs> and again, guys, like, you know, why uh, why Alex and I go to these masterminds is because you're getting to, uh, to network with, you know, high-level people. So, you know, keep in mind that, again, this, this is an open format. So, you know, use the room and, and, you know, figure out people that can help you. So like, I'll give you guys a, an example, Ed, um, you know, over there, Ed does multi-million dollar houses in Los Angeles. Um, you know, so 
Alex and I don't do multifamily or multi-million dollar houses in Los Angeles, but you know, Ed and his partner do. So, um, you know, when those kind of questions come up, that's who we lean on. So, um, you know, use these types of rooms and, and these types of opportunities to, you know, again, it, it grow what it is that you're trying to do, right? What's up, Ed? Are you at the mastermind? What's up? Yeah, man. Pre-gaming right now. I'm about to hang out. <laughs> That's right, man. Did you have your hand up or no? No, no, Is... no. Just cheers, brother. That's yeah, it. cheers. What's up, everybody? Yeah. Um, I see you got a couple of no what's up, Noriel? What's up, Ben? What's up, Mr. Scott? Bruce, why do you and your brother have two first names? It's like David Bruce and Scott Bruce. Like, like <laughs> anyways, I'll call him you guys. What's up, Andy? We got oh, we got Marina in the house. Uh, you guys, so guys we got a uh, we got one question coming in that I, I think is a great question to start with, and um, it's from Rashawn uh, asking about an LLC. Um, and so, Rashawn, let us know a little bit more specifically, like when you talk about creating an LLC, what kind of questions do you have, man? Hey, everyone, man, excited to be here. Um, just curious, um, do you guys create LLCs for each individual flips or? Uh, are you guys creating each individual LLCs per property you guys own or how do you guys structuring everything to protect yourself? Uh, good question. So the primary, there's a primary, uh, there's a couple of, of LLCs. I don't recommend usually getting an LLC for every single property because then that could that'd be expensive too, if especially if it's in California. But um, it, we use a primary one for the flipping and then we have another secondary for more of a hold type of properties as well. So um, we're only using two right now at the moment, but um, other investors that use different systems. So um, I'd recommend looking a little bit more into it. But if you haven't done at least a you know, handful of deals, I'd say you know, three to five, I, 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 worrying about LLCs and structuring and all that, I think is a little bit premature personally. If anybody you can, else has you can add, yeah, you can uh, flip a house on your own personal name. You don't really even need an LLC to flip the house. It might help with your hard money loan, but you know, technically yeah. you can do that on, on your own name. Um, without having an LLC. Um, you know, I'll give you guys another example. Like I've been working with Alex for, you know, over a year and I got an LLC maybe five months ago um, because it got to the point where it was like, hey, do I want to stack this income on my personal or on my business? And, you know, it, it, like Alex said, like it now became relevant. I didn't need to worry about it on the first deal because it was like, all right, I'm going to get a couple thousand dollar check. Like I'm going to make a couple bucks. Like not really the biggest priority to spend a thousand of that on, a lawyer to draft up the documents or your time and effort to do it on your own on legal zone, right? Yeah, but if you're spending money on, on the business, if you are act actively already spending money and say, hey, you're you're launching marketing campaigns and you're paying for this, paying for that, then I also think that at that point, then yeah, that would be a point to get an LLC because you or you, you've already treated it kind of like a business. So yeah, I mean, Roshan, that would be my my next follow up question to you is like, is it at the point where you think? that you would need to get the LLC or is this just something that you're kind of looking future, uh, you know, down the line for? Um, right now I have my first property already, um, house hacking that and the second one I'm closing soon this month. Um, that's going to be another primary residence and house hacking that as well. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I should put both the properties in one individual LLC, just, you know, just cover my bases. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I think, um, the, you know, talking to your CPA, talking to how you're going to be filing should be one way, but um, I don't think you need multiple LCs at this point yet, personally, but talk to you. Yeah, yeah. And I'd love to get Ed's feedback on that because I know, Ed, you guys have, you know, 10, 10 deals going on. Like, you guys aren't doing an LLC for each one, are you? No, uh, we, have, we have one main LLC where we do all our deals in, and then we have another one for buy and holds. So we have one for flipping, basically, and one for buy and holds. Yeah. Same, same thing. Yeah. And the reason why they're doing that is so you have your liability for your fix and flips under one business and then your liability for your holds on another one. Um, you know, and again, gotcha. as long as you're putting out quality work up to code, um, you know, you shouldn't really have any of those kind of, you know, problems arising up if you're picking the right buyers and, you know, doing the right process. Yes, gotcha. sir. And Ed, uh, I'm assuming you have a huge umbrella policy, personal umbrella policy, you just cover, cover you as well? Um, we don't, we don't have an umbrella policy. We just get, we do, um, we get individual insurance policies for each property. Okay. Yeah, so we, do we, that as, we do that as well. We get in, individual insurance quotes, um, you know, and coverage for each individual property, um, as opposed to just kind of a, a blanket coverage. 
because you know each individual property might have different risks associated with it. We bought one the other day in a flood zone, uh, which just wouldn't make sense for us to apply that blanket coverage to all of our other houses that aren't in that zone. Yep. Yeah, and in addition to that, I think the, the hard money lender, sometimes they require certain things for each property as well. So kind of like uh, adding on to what Will says, like it, it, you have to kind of customize it, the insurance to the property. Sounds All right, good. Well, thank you. Well, so I have some questions or put some offers in, wants to talk about some deals. Yeah, and I, I love uh, Maria's comment down there as well. Like she was just kind of mentioning that, you know, again, Rashawn, like I would talk to your, your you know, tax professional as well and just kind of see like, hey, which would be the easiest way for me if I was trying to protect myself and, you know, get some extra coverage. So good stuff, man. Congrats on the uh, the deal that you locked up and, uh, you know, getting that second house hack. That's awesome. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Learning from the best. All right. And then I know the, uh, the next question that was coming in was from Oscar. Um, so Oscar was asking, are we the closers in the business or do we have people that do that for us? Um, Alex, I'll let you start with that one. Um, well, I think it, it, at the beginning, you either need to be the closer yourself um, and, and or have someone in your team. For myself, I'm a closer. So I, you know, I was the closer. And then uh, once I started my company, then I brought in another closer, which is Will. Um, and now Will is bringing on other closers uh, beneath him. So I think uh, you can never go without a closer, uh, but sometimes that's not you going in uh, to the business. It's, you know, maybe that's not your personality. So I think it's, it's really, really important. I think it's underrated too, that people um, don't have like highly skilled closers on their team when they're doing this business. You need people that can convert, you, you know, that can get the signature of the contract, can go into those tough meetings with sellers, and, and then you'll just have those strong negotiation skills. And so you need some some solid, solid uh, closers on your team. And I think that's been a common theme with us. Like either I was a solid closer for another company, or then I went off on my own and you know, I was just doing a couple of deals on my own every month, but it was, it was, I was just constantly in that um, closing mode, right? And then um, when I went to move to Hawaii, I mean, that's the first thing I look for, like someone to replace me because I knew I couldn't go to that property, that meeting, to that seller's house anymore. So although, you know, everybody talks about work, everybody, talks about, everybody but talks about virtual, um, I, I'm not in Southern California. I haven't seen that to be as strong. So I'm like, you know, hey, Andy, um, I think you're, you're you're bringing in some um, static. So, yeah, that, does that answer your question or do you want to add anything to that, Will? No, yeah, I agree, right? Like when you guys do get leads, like the last thing you want to do is ruin the lead, right? Like, um, or waste the lead. I wouldn't say ruin it, but like waste it, right? Because when you get that lead, when somebody says, hey, I, I would be interested in selling my house or an agent is like, yeah, this, this seller is, is open to listening to your offer. The, the close is the most immediate, most important part of that. Would you agree, Alex? Like at that point, you have to go for the close and you have to know when to close and how to close. There's hundreds of ways to close. Right. Like there's the open ended question close like, hey, Ed, are you paying for that with a credit card or check? You know, and like that's implying like, hey, you are buying this. How are you going to pay for it? There's, you know, would you prefer the money in cash or would you prefer a lender to do the loan? Right. Like that's again, that's a that's a close option. Right. So, you know, you want to make sure that when you get those opportunities, you are putting your best foot forward. And um, Alex and I, we talked about this initially. Right, Alex, like it's tough to give up that closing opportunity when you are a closer. Right. You, really, you want to be in the game. Yeah, absolutely. I want to take that shot. You know, I want the opportunity. I, I've been there in the trenches. I've been on the conversations and I, I want to take that shot. But to develop your team, you know, eventually you do need to uh, have other people take that shot and miss it. But um, that's why you need to be out there constantly looking for opportunities. But that way you can get more of those reps in and then you get better. And you, you almost thought uh, because it is a high stakes business. Like you work, say, you know, 56 days in a row and just grinding it out. And then you get that one solid lead or that one solid opportunity, I mean, you don't really want to mess that up. And so it'll take you longer to get your deals or more deals, uh, depending if you did yours already, um, if you you know mess up and don't have somebody strong in that department. So it just, it can't be underrated. Um, closing is, uh, and, and I don't mean close like, uh, like a used car salesman, although, I mean, they tend to like really know how to close, right? But it more so is like someone that has like the understanding, uh, but also the capacity to know when to like really, is you have to be versatile closer too. Like I, the way I close somebody that maybe is like losing their property would maybe be a little bit different than somebody just like I meet an agent and I want them to take my offer. 
think it would be different closing situations. But nonetheless, they, they do come with a certain amount of pressure and a, a certain amount of stakes. So make sure that you have about someone very confident, either yourself, you, and you could work on it. We, we, we just interviewed Steve Trang last week. He's one of the, I mean, he's one of those type of people that was not a natural closer, and he's now he's one of the best closers in the game. But I mean, I, I would say that that isn't common, but he's worked a lot on that part of his business, and now he's become a trainer on it. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I love, uh, I love the guy, but, you know, Drake, uh, has a song out and he, you know, he says, tell the coach not to take me out. I like to finish games. Right. And I mean, like, that's how I kind of look at it. Like, man, I don't want Alex to take me out. I want to have that opportunity to close. I want to finish that lead. I want to get that guy. Um, but you know, like you said, like, if you don't, if you are not that person, you might not want to, you know, risk those leads all on your own. You might want to bring in somebody else to help close. And, and while you work on bettering yourself, while you take some of those courses, while you take a Steve Trang sales class on how to be a better seller, you know, then it might be more relevant for you to say, Hey, now I want to take those shots. But, um, and like, like Alex said, like Alex was lucky because he knew I was a closer already coming in and that's why we were able to align well on our business. So if you aren't a closer, just like in all other facets of business, like find those talents that you're not good at and fill those roles. Right. Yeah. And I think another thing to add on is maybe don't look at it so much as closing as is persuasion skills. Right. It's like, somebody needs to possess strong persuasion skills in your organization and hopefully a lot of people right even your rehab you're your project manager you want him to persuade the contractor to give you a better deal right you want your acquisitions manager to persuade everybody they can to give us better deals you know so the, you want your escrow to persuade the other buyer side to get things done faster so persuasion skills are highly valuable and that's what really we're talking about is and 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 not everybody can you know is naturally talented in persuasion but it, it it actually trickles up too, where like, okay, you use it for the acquisitions, all that. But do you think like me becoming friends with some of these high level people also it has not taken some amount of persuasion? Of course, I, you know, I, I persuade the right people to become my friend and to be in my life because I know that there's going to be a huge benefit to me. So keep that in mind, you guys, you're persuading people to be your friends, you're persuading, um, you know, property owners to take your you know, offer, all these things that are persuasion skills. So work on it. Uh, it can't be undervalued. And Oscar, I'd just love to ask you, man, like, are, are you the closer in your business or are you looking to bring in somebody in that role? I see some other people we haven't seen in a while. What's up? What's up, Mr. Martin? What's up? Hi, Casey. How are you? So we got a, another question coming in here um, from an anonymous attendee asking a little bit about hard money lenders and some questions that you would ask when looking to work with one. Uh, the first one is uh, how many deals have they closed? In the last like three to six months, uh, I just want to know are they, are they, I mean, what does that look like for them? Are, are they brand new to the business or, or are they seasoned? Um, I say the, the second big thing is what kind of uh, how would they rate their service um, and how you know what's their communication style in general? Because um, you know you just want to have someone that's super responsive. These deals deal, deal, deals move very fast, and you need people that be able to kind of you know kind of keep to that pace. Um, also, I'm always looking to learn stuff from hard money lenders. And that's why I asked about the experience part. I mean, a hard money lenders, you know, done 200 deals over the last couple of years, uh, probably can teach you something more than the guy that just got into the game in the last quarter that maybe he's only closed like a handful of deals. So I think, um, you know, that competence of like what's happening right now, of how are other flippers structuring their deals? How are other investors keeping some more properties? Um, so like, for example, one of our hard money lenders now is providing some, you know, some refinance options of some of our properties. And, um, you know, we... One lender is actually super strong uh, on the acquisition side, but on the refinance side, not so much, right? And then the other one is not as good on the acquisitions, but then they're really good to refi. So we have to kind of combo those up. So um, yeah, um, also if you're a new investor, I would ask these uh, lenders like, hey, I mean, how do you guys look at newer investors? Do I have to partner up? Or if I have enough assets, if I have enough, a good enough deal, will you fund me? You know, just something that simple, like, hey, I need to know, will you be able to give me a loan? Uh, I'm out there hunting, I will get something. And I would just add to that, guys, ask like what their paperwork process is, like how much paperwork do we need to do? Because, you know, that's a big one for us as well. We get hit up and approached by hard money lenders all the time. And it's like, well, am I going to have to do another credit check? Am I going to have to do another application? Am I going to have to do all these these steps? And if you do, then that might be, you know, detrimental, whereas another uh, hard money lender might be like, hey, we're going to run a credit check and get a, a, a bank statement on file and we're good to go. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I had to partner up you guys on my first couple deals simply because um, 
you know, the hard money lender didn't want to give me a loan because I hadn't had a deal in my name yet. So you want to get that out, the, out there in the open right away. All right. And I love what you said too about asking the experience, right? Because guys, at the end of the day, like we consider our hard money lender kind of like our final set of eyes, you know, right? If they look at the deal and they're like, bro, what are you thinking? Like, you guys are going to lose money on this thing. And like, we want to know that, like, how knowledgeable are you in these areas that we're investing in, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes um, different hard money lenders have different appetites. And we've talked about this in previous webinars and meetups, like, just remember, not every hard money lender will like that deal. Whereas like, for example, Joshua Tree, a couple of our lenders don't like it. It's just very remote. They're like, ah, oh, you know, we're not, they give us some kind of high rates. And we're like, dude, the guy over here is giving us way better offer because they understand what's happening in Joshua Tree a lot better. This other lender is a little bit more national, but not as local to Southern California, I guess I would say. And so it's like, it, just have to have different lending options because there's so many moving parts, like based on the deal and the opportunity that you presented. So um, having multiple contacts within hard money lending is, is super valuable, putting deals together. Um, so I, I see uh, another question coming in here. And, um, you know, it's, it's from Bobby asking about the, the blanket insurance policy. So, um, you know, what maybe we'll do, Alex, is we'll bring on, you know, our insurance broker that kind of helps us out with insurance for one of our upcoming calls as a special guest. And um, we can kind of just do a deep dive into insurance. Um, Alex and I filed our first insurance claim on one of our properties. We had a flood on it. So we can kind of give you guys a little bit of, you know, background on how that went, what the process was like. How <laughs> it, was a headache, it, was. it was a headache, but it made us another $25,000. So. Yep. So, I mean, like, you, you know, it, it's, they're beneficial, right? So we'll, we'll definitely, if, if that's a question that you guys have, we'd be happy to bring on our insurance broker and, um, you know, have her kind of drop some game and, and, uh, help educate us all on that subject. So we'll, we'll definitely yeah. get that done sometime here in the future, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to skip out on the insurance coverage, man. It'll end up biting, biting in the butt. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I think I, I had, a, I just had a broker approach me about like packaging, you know, five or eight or your flips under one policy. So I didn't know how that, I get the individual policies, the the vacant ones and they're expensive. You know, they're like 2000 or 2,500 per per house. And I just didn't know if anybody's tried that that blanket policy, or I don't know much about it, so I was just checking. Yeah, we'll we'll look into it too. Actually, that's a good idea. We uh, we we should consider it. But yeah, I, I think I think the other thing to address, like, so I just had something pretty big too. I uh, we had a big storm in Sacramento, and it's kind of negligence on the the roofer, and we got a, a big leak and mold and da da da, and caused a ton of headaches. Probably similar to what you guys had, and it it was. I was trying to understand, should I file a claim or not, right? Because if, you know, I'm doing, you know, 12 or 15 flips a year, you know, what is the insurance policy going to go? I, I got a background in insurance. So obviously, you know, you file a claim, your policy is going to go up, right? So that, that'd be an interesting topic to ask them as well to evaluate. Like, if you're just going to put a claim in for five <laughs> or $10,000, it doesn't make sense. It's got to be 20, 40 or 50. And and you know, in your insurance policy goes up for maybe three to five years. So if your each flips policy is going up three to five hundred dollars, and you're doing ten or so a year, you know how what is, what is the math of breaking even on something like that? Just something. Yeah, like that. yeah absolutely. No, I think yeah, you're making a valid point because we we were paying the leak and, and the flood out of our own, our own pocket, but once this really started going up in price, we're like, hey, I mean, this thing might not have a this thing might have a very deep bottom over here. We might as well just do the insurance claim because there was a lot of back and forth and getting this thing, um, it was actually listed. Uh, but I mean, we'll bring her on because uh, our insurance lady uh, is a seasoned investor, owns you know, a huge portfolio of like 40, 50 properties, um, also has done some flips in the past and and, and also, so we, we need to get her on, right, Will? Because I think- uh, yeah, yeah, like you said, she's an investor herself. So not just insurance, but like she can provide some investor, you know, eyesight or, or you know, investor background on that insurance stuff. And so, yeah, I think we'll definitely get her on at some point here in the near future and, and uh, would love to ask her some questions for you guys. Yeah. What is it? I, uh, last point I'll say is, it, yeah, I mean, at the beginning when I was doing this, I would always purchase the wrong policies because I, I wanted to, you know, maybe quote unquote cut a corner and do an, if you do an occupied policy, it's probably 800 to a thousand bucks versus if you're doing a vacant policy, it's, you know, 2000 to 2,500 and all these insurance companies, they look for every loophole if there's actually a claim or if something big happens. So I, yeah, absolutely. There's two so, sides to it for sure. So we got another question in coming in here from uh, Mr. Scott Bruce, or did we miss the one here from 
when managing and paying contractors, what pay structure timeline to use that works best? I think that question is best for you, Will, because you and Amari have been doing a great job of getting that on the system. Yeah, so I mean, the, the process that we work best is a milestone completion process, right? So at the beginning of the project, we sit down with the contractor and we bang out what timelines he wants to do. So we give him a, 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 an opportunity and say, when would you be able to finish this project? And then I ask them again, I say, so you would be able to finish this by this date? They say, yep. And then we offer a bonus if they finish it earlier than that date. And we have a penalty if it is beyond that date. We have them sign that agreement and we sign our agreement. Then once we have determined what their timeline is for completion, and that's how we usually bid out our projects is how many work days would it take you guys to complete this labor? Once we know that amount of days, then we will say, okay, so it's, uh, you know, just call it 60 days. So that's an eight week project. So that contractor might want to have eight payments because typically our contractors pay their guys on a Friday. So we're fine with that. Again, that comes with communication with your contractors. And then we set up a milestone system. So if they want to be paid every Friday and it's an eight week project, week one would be what? Demo and trash out. So if you want to get paid for week one, I should have pictures in our Google Drive and our contractors, our project managers upload all those into the Google Drive for us, send it over to me and say, hey, Will, I want to request a payment. And I look at those pictures and I go, hey, you know what? You trashed out. Like you did that. You did your job. You did your milestone. I'll go ahead and sign that milestone off and I will go ahead and authorize that check. Um, on the flip side, if I go and you say that you are going to do kitchen install and I look at the kitchen and the kitchen is not installed, then I have a very clear reason to be like, well, look, I, I cannot give you this $5,000 because like, why would I do that if the kitchen is not done? That would mean that next week's payment would also be delayed. And you said that the kitchen would be done by three weeks. So yeah, and, um, I, can I answer real quickly that I will? Yeah, please Essentially, do. What, you really, what we're really trying to always avoid is be where we, we are so far advanced on the project and we paid them say 75%, but they've only done 25% of the work. So what you want to do is kind of keep that really close to each other where, hey, and you know what, they're making some profit and they got other projects and whatnot. We're okay with, hey, we're 20%, maybe even 25% ahead of the project, but no more than that. Because then that's when, you know, a contractor can really skip town and then take some of your money and then not finish the project and then you, you lose some money. So that's what you want to really avoid and have everything kind of clear. If you need to continue, well, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and you said it you said it perfectly there, right? Like we don't want to overload, like we don't want to be you know behind schedule. So um, you know, we had our contractor on our, our most recent property that we just finished, and um, you know, he was delayed on a week. And we told him we were like, hey man, we can't get you this payment because we need to have that done before we can authorize that payment. The cool thing about that process, guys, is who's the asshole? It's me. It's Alex, right? We're the bad guys, we're the ones that need to have this system completed for you to get a check authorized. So our project manager is, is really just kind of the guy in the middle that's like, hey, like, I got to get this picture taken to get the check. Do you have the picture taken? No, you didn't do the work. Then I, I can't get the check, right? Yep. Um, also, we just, you know, kind of connected with one of, um, you know, the, the people in Alex's network um, through the Maui Mastermind. And he provided us with a new check company called eChecks. So we are now using eChecks for the majority of our vendors. And that just allows us to speed it up even more. So I can literally from my phone submit a check for our contractor on a Friday and it can be signed by Alex and in that contractor's inbox by the end of the day, if he has done his job by the end of the day, like he was supposed to. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, that makes sense, guys? That was a great question, Scott, I love it. Okay, and it says here, okay, let me answer Scott's question. What do you use to track your progress on a flip? Do you have a deal checklist for a flip we, we just locked up? Um, well, I'd say we have the project management checklist, like we were just talking about the milestone, and then in our CRM, we're tracking the progress of flips, whatever stage they're in. But our actual checklist, um, it's a more of a transaction checklist that we have, like, uh, you know, this needs to happen every single part of the transaction. So um, I would say, yeah, we, we do, we, we can share that with you. Will, do you uh, mind sharing that with Scott? Yeah, you know, we, we have our, our checklist, again, like on our, our transaction side, and then um, Scott, for the, the contractor, we do. You got a, a flip, you got a flip, Scott? Yeah? He's smiling like he does. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll definitely share a copy the of that. Mute button. Yeah, I locked up a, a property in Hilo with David this past week. Found one, uh, 
on a foreclosure auction he ran over that morning, put in the bid. Well, we're just going back and forth on them. They're trying to add on a 5% premium. But uh, yeah, we locked it up for 260. It's only a 10 year old house and the ARV should be around four and a quarter to 450. So nice. Excited, but I just want to make sure. Nice, dude. I'm checking all the boxes and not leaving anything out. Okay, well, um, our project manager on Maui, Mike, is flying over probably next week on our project in Hilo. So if you need anything on your, uh, you know, any boots on the ground stuff, let us know. We're happy to help, you know. I appreciate that. I got David there. Make him do yeah. some work. Yeah, of course. I make him do some work. But, you know, he's a couple hours away from that side. That's all. Um, yeah, that is true. But, uh, Will, yeah, so you get with Will. And if you need, like, some of our, you know, templates or whatnot, we do, uh, we've been pretty good. And they might yeah, be, I you might need to be more specific for your transaction, but you'll get the hint. All right. Yeah, guys, if, if you haven't, um, I'm just sharing my screen here real quick. If you guys haven't been on our Facebook group yet, you can always go over here and, and we'll upload these kind of files that you guys are asking for right here in that file section. Um, so I know somebody was asking about a JV agreement or a purchase agreement. This is a blank purchase contract. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll always make sure that we, you know, post those kind of documents in there if, if those are things that you guys want to want to have access to. Um, I know we had another question coming in from Josh. Uh, so Josh is asking about permits. Are we pulling permits on all of our rehabs or just big rehabs? And Josh, I want to ask you a question. Do you work for the city of Los Angeles? <laughs> because if you do, then we, of course, of course. Yeah. Hey, I, I know. I know. Sorry, I'm just not following the lights get a little, it's a little loud, so I'm pull over here real quick. You know, we just, you know, we wouldn't want to tell a city inspector that, that we don't, but um, yeah, we, we, I mean, we want to pull permits on, on houses. Like we want to pull permits when they're necessary and when they're needed, but when they don't make sense for what we're doing on a project, like a lot of the projects that Alex and I are focusing on are just, you know, properties that we're not adding any square footage to. We're just taking a broken house and we're making it a better house, right? We're taking a a you know property that's been through some deferred maintenance and we're fixing that deferred maintenance so you know do you really need to have a, a, a you know an inspector come out and inspect that wall if you didn't change the wall like no and if they're not yeah. going to be out there to check on it within the week and you can't do anything for that week the way most of our contractors work guys is they hire labor for the week right they say hey you're going to get this job for the week and then we'll bring you back next week and the week after if you have a week gap or two week gap where you're not able to provide work for those guys those guys find work someplace else and then you have to restart that process um you know so again it's, it's a it's a never-ending circle but to your question joshua yes like we pull permits when needed and when necessary and when we sell our properties we just let people know hey if permits were needed they weren't pulled everything was done in a craftsman-like manner up to code but if a permit was needed you know we didn't pull it yeah so I, let, me, let me let me give my two cents you guys about the whole uh, permitting thing because i got a quick story about that so when i first when i first started working for the, the second big company I, I went to go work for guys we were flipping like over 150 200 houses a year so naturally i was like oh hey we're pulling permits for everything look how many houses that we're flipping so i went to go talk to like the project managers and they all looked at me like i was fucking smoking crack or something they're like what no like we don't we avoid it as much as possible and then um, I would see the end product, obviously, because I would go look at the houses that we finished. But uh, the point with all that was that it's one of those things that is not openly talked about, but basically most investors just avoid city in involvement. And that includes pulling permits as much as possible because it, it rarely has a lot of upside to it. Um, now, granted, I will say this. I would like to do that. I personally from an ethical standpoint, I would like to just pull permits on every single thing and do everything by the book. But that would, we also would not be able to run a profitable business if we did that, to be real. Um, another thing I want to say about that is it also, it, it varies highly based on a couple of things. The neighborhood, for example, if you're like in a neighborhood that's a higher end neighborhood, very sensitive and kind of bougie people, well, then you might need to pull that. If you're in like Newport Beach or some of these other like fancy areas like Mr. Scott Bruce over there, you can't be doing construction next to these other million dollar property without, you know, pulling permits because the neighbors are going to rat you out. You know, it's just that, it's that simple. Um, you also, have permits for that boat ramp in the backyard. Like they're going to let, you know, they're going to let you know, like, man, you got to get that done. Exactly. Um, another thing guys is like, you have to feel out the neighborhood. So for instance, on my house hack, um, I just talked to one of the neighbors and the neighbor was like, yeah, the guy across the street has actually called in the city and reported everybody on this block. Yeah. 
So I said, well, what do you think that means I'm going to do? Yep. Means I'm going to probably just go ahead and bite the bullet and, and pull those permits on the front end because otherwise I'm going to get reported on the back end. And um, he's a, a handyman, the guy on the block, and he gets mad when people on the block don't hire him. And so he you know, calls in and, and reports you. So, uh, you know, that's just something you have to deal with. And, and Alex, I love how you said it too. Like it really depends on the property, right? Because some of our houses, for example, out in California City, Lancaster, Palmdale, people out there would actually prefer to have that bonus space whether it's permitted or not, because, you know, you're living out there for that extra space. Whereas somebody in, you know, a Newport beach, like Scott, you know, that, like Alex said, like if you're next to another million dollar mansion and your million dollar mansion doesn't have permits pulled, like it's not a million dollar mansion at that point. Right. Yeah. I know. Granted, if you're adding property, you're adding stuff to the property and you're doing an ADU or any of that, then obviously you're going to have to pull permits. Also, I want to say something else. If you're like on a main street, and you don't pull permits, you're taking a higher risk because that property is in view of a lot more people. So likely, it's likely an inspector might drive by and then there's no permits pulled, you're gonna get popped on that. So I think you also, is you know, the, those are things that should not be overlooked that where the property lies within the area. And then um, also I think the scope of work, if you I mean it's a light rehab in an area that's kind of a little bit out of the way, I mean, why would you pull permits on that? You're gonna just tap an extra time. Whereas it's heavy rehab in a highly visible area, I mean, it'd be different. So a couple factors there, guys, just keep that in mind. Um, and then there's, oh, one last thing. There's a way where you could kind of just pull a, a, a kitchen and bathroom remodel, right? And then just, and you're doing quote unquote, a per quick kitchen and bathroom remodel, but you're probably doing a little bit more, right? So um, that way you have pull permits, but if you're moving around some, you know, some walls and whatnot, I mean, maybe there wasn't permits pulled for that, right? So I think that those are also the things that, you know, I've seen other project managers that work for us or I've worked with to do just kind of, hey, we're in a highly visible area. We're going to pull the kid, you know, basic remodel permit. And then that kind of helps shield us a little bit from other stuff that maybe we might consider doing. Let's say that. Or even neighbors, right? So if you pull that kitchen and bathroom permit, then if a neighbor were to call the city, they'd be like, well, yeah, they, get, they pulled their permits last week. So they are good to do the construction that they're doing right now. Yeah, and if you're not going to the pro a property uh, regularly, keep this in mind. Sometimes these uh, contractors and these workers, these subs, are going to the property hella early, seven in the morning, they're banging. Doing... So even in a rough area, somebody might call rat you out just simply because of your crew not being respectful, not kind of just getting low, because they like to get there real early. Look, look at my man Rod is shaking his head, right? They want to get in, in and out. They're like, oh, get there safe and they want to be out of there by you know noon or two or three. But at what expense? They're, 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 you know, roughing some feathers in the neighborhood and they're making you look bad as an investor and you're more likely to get called and, and uh, you know, get popped by the city no matter what area you're in. So all these little nuances, a great question. I'm glad we're able to share this with you guys because we've had it happen to us and we've been red tagged and all that and it's not fun. <laughs> and guys, the other thing is like, keep an idea of where the building permit office is. So like I bought a house and we got red tagged on it last week. And the reason why is because I didn't know the area. Right. So I had no clue that I purchased a house two blocks away from the city permit office. So where do you think the permit inspector had to drive? Is that yucca? Yeah, yucca. Come they, on, bro. Their, their office is two blocks away. So every day when that inspector comes back from lunch, where do you think he drives by? Well, two blocks away from my house. So was it hard for him to take that two block detour one day? No, probably not. Right. It was very easy. So like Alex mentioned, like the further out you are, maybe a little bit you know, less chances, the more main street you are, um, you know, those are all just, just different little things to kind of keep in, uh, into consideration, right? Yep, yep, yep. And then one, one last thing I think is just ask other investors in the area too, like if we were going to do some crazy stuff like Ed does, we'd ask Ed what's up, right? And so just, uh, you know, network, talk to other investors, see what they're doing in their mar in your market too, just so that way you can get um, feedback from people that are actively doing rehabs that whether or not they're pulling, rehab, you know, permits in that area or not. Cool. Right, guys, another, uh, I see another great, uh, yeah, go ahead, Josh. Uh, Joshua? Yeah. No, I'm just saying thank you so much for the response. I'm, I'm here in San Diego, and I was uh, actually, since you did mention that, is it, I wonder if you guys have any groups or something like that around here in San Diego area. Any what? Any, like, networking groups here around San Diego? Or, or, or... I would connect on our Facebook group. So same thing on the Facebook group. Um, we have a post on there. The first <laughs> post on there says, roll call, where's everybody from? And people just kind of post in there. Same with over here on the right side. Like, I don't personally know many uh, meetups down in San Diego just because, you know, Alex and I love San Diego, but we aren't down there all the time. So 
Um, we didn't know of any in LA, so that's why we kind of started this one is we wanted to you know, create a community for people in the area. So uh, you might be able to find some folks down there in you know, San Diego, but I know for a fact, like we have 10, 15 people in the, the Facebook group that are down there. At least. If there isn't a group, then you can yeah. start your own group, right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys, appreciate it. So I saw a uh, killer question come in from Marina asking about the contractors, like how do we handle that when they go overtime, right? Um, so for example, on our flood, our contractor was already complete. So we were listed, ready to go. And the listing agent went to the house and said, hey, the house is flooding. Um, was it the contractor's fault? No, it was actually in an area that he did not even touch. Um, so he was good. He, he didn't get a, 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 you know, a, a late fee or anything on that. On the flip side, on one of our recent projects that we just had, our contractor went three weeks overboard. And I waived the fee for two of those weeks because two of those weeks uh, we were Christmas and we were um, Thanksgiving. And he didn't think that in when he baked out his, his timeline. And then he also had a personal family issue where he was out of work uh, taking care of his daughter in the hospital uh, with COVID. And so I said, hey, look, like we're people at the end of the day, you're a person. I want to do long-term business with you and create a long-term relationship. So I, I bit the bullet and we said, hey, that, that extra you know, $1,400 of, of late fee, is that going to make or break this deal? No. But is this guy going to maybe do another contract or, or job with us? Yeah, probably. And so you know, we, we just kind of made that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. But to your question, Marina, like you just really have to kind of feel it out case-by-case, situation-by-situation. Situation. If it's a contractor fault, then I would put that fault on them. And if they're not able to get that fault remedied in time to finish their project, then I would still put that fault on them. Yeah. 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 I see another one coming in about insurance, right? Did we get, did we get to that one yet or no? No, this is Karen asking one about, do you guys recommend uh, one insurance person for rentals in multiple states? And, um, you know, same thing on there. Like, you know, I, I don't want to give you the wrong piece of advice because we currently aren't really purchasing properties in multiple states outside of just Hawaii and Los Angeles and, and California. But we do use the same insurance person for those. Well, um, well no, but the, no, the people we use for, um, we use a different insurance provider in Hawaii than we do for California, though. Yeah, but in LA we, or in California, we use our same insurance agent yeah. for all of our deals in, in California. And we use our same insurance agent for all of our deals in Maui. Or on the islands, I guess, because they, they cover all the islands usually. Well, yeah, they've actually been to the one we have for Maui is different than what we have for the big island. There so, you go. Because the big island is, uh, is in the lava zone. So, I mean. <laughs> the, lava look, zones, flood zones, a lot of those things to keep in mind, right? We, we own a house in the lava zone. Man, there's crazy times here. <laughs> so, flood uh, insurance, lava insurance. Oh. Yeah, so guys, I think this was a great call, you know, kind of getting to talk a little bit about, you know, contractors, getting to talk about insurance. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate it when, when you guys bring those kind of things up because it, it lets us know like, hey, this is definitely something that, you know, we had five or six questions on insurance. And so that means like we would be more than happy to bring on our insurance, you know, specialist and maybe both of them, Alex, like if we need to bring on, you know, a, a Maui insurance person to talk about lava zones, like we, you know, we can probably get that on for you guys as well. <laughs> Well, I think we need, yeah, we need Lorena on because she's an investor and she's been helping with a lot of our deals and uh, yep. we're making her a lot of money. So she better come on and drop some value. Let's get it. So guys, um, you know, we got 15 minutes left. Um, I encourage anybody, you know, if you haven't spoken up yet or, or you know, given any, any feedback or, or um, you know, any comments, like this is your chance, guys. Um, you know, you heard Bobby. Bobby had some questions on insurance. Scott had some questions on a, on a flip he's taken down. So you know, whenever you're in these rooms, like I'm at a mastermind right now, um, I'll show you guys around right here. This is, you know, Ryan's office right here that I'm hanging out in. It is, you know, his massive little office desk in here. Um, but, you know, again, when, when you go to these types of masterminds, like I was out here and I connected with three or four people that are doing things better than I am in certain, you know, aspects of real estate investing. So maybe, you know, you talk to somebody that's doing the contracting stuff better than you, and now you're getting better at that as well. So keep that in mind, guys. We do this once a month. Every month we do this. It's not no agenda. There's no, you know, us talking about insurance or us talking about hard money lender. It's, it's literally just an open format for you guys. And uh, if nobody else has any questions, what I like to do is just kind of open it up for anybody. If you have any big wins, like we love sharing wins, because I think when you hear about a win like Scott, 
taking down a deal in Newport Beach, like that motivates me to be like, hey man, I can go get my next deal. Like there's another deal out there for me. I, I just, you know, needed that one piece of motivation knowing that he got his first deal in 2022 that I can get mine too, right? I, I got a win and a question if I could jump in. Let's go. Mike, so drop. let's go. Yeah, for, first and foremost, the win, I'm about to close on a duplex and that's door number four and five. And that's all happened within you guys starting this, you know, just let's go taking action. I mean, that's is that really, Den are you in Denver or where? Yeah, I'm, I'm in Denver, but actually these properties are in Indiana. So I, I partnered up with, with someone out there, um, you know, super cheap property out there. But, uh, you know, and, and that was just all through networking, talking to people, you know, just, um, getting to know the right people and just taking taking those actions. You know, Alex, you always say that just just do it, take action, you know, so um so yeah, that that's happening soon. So you know, thanks for all the the encouragement and help, and you know, hopefully that can encourage somebody else to, you know, just take that next step. Um, that's awesome. Ben. That's a huge win, bro. Doors four and yeah. five, like you know, out of state investing, like that. That's a huge win, brother. Congratulations. Yeah, that's, that's thank huge. you. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So and then my next step is uh, I'm gonna do a house hack. So I'm looking for a fourplex actually out, out in Vegas. So and I know that was brought up earlier. So you know, it just any anything outside the the obvious or the ordinary or maybe not so obvious, um, you know, just things to look for when house hacking and uh, fourplex specifically. I'll let you know, cause I just locked up a, a house hack. The one big thing is like, keep in mind, is this going to be your forever home or not? Because I think, you know, the first thing that happened to me when I walked the house and I was like, oh, I'm moving into this one. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And then I got the, the bid and I was like, whoo, like I'm not, <laughs> not going to be doing any of that will like we're going to have to reassess um you know some of those those you know walk-in closets that you were thinking about doing like yeah we can't do that you know and so just keep that in mind like for me my house hack is is that's all it is is it's a one to two year property that i will be moving out of and turning into into cash flow uh cow so do i need my cash flow cow to have granite probably not i can get away with quartz like can i get away with lvp instead of tile in the bathrooms for sure would i like tile in the bathrooms yeah it would have been great um, was I just out visiting some luxury houses out here in Vegas uh, with the Bokley brothers and, you know, getting really excited about all their luxury features? Yeah, of course. Um, but, you know, you just got to kind of pump the brakes on that. And, and um, that would be my one big suggestion. And then the other big suggestion is treat it differently than a flip. So the reason why we were able to buy this house hack is because we didn't look at it as a flip. It actually didn't qualify as a flip for us. It didn't hit our profit threshold. And that's where it was like, hey, well, this would be a good house hack. So just, you know, keep that in mind that the numbers should tally different between a house hack versus a, a standard flip or, or a standard investment property. Sure. Yeah, my biggest, my biggest suggestion, Ben, on the house hack, I've said it many times on, on this webinar and meetup is that if I were to go back, I would just get the biggest, best fourplex I can get. I mean, if I can get something in a nicer area and a bigger square footage and a bigger lot size and maybe four separate buildings or just, uh, you know, not every single fourplex is, is built the same. So if I'm going to get a low down payment loan, that to me, it just makes sense to just leverage, um, not leverage like recklessly, but if you have a bigger property, it, there's more upside potential with the rents. Um, there's just, you know, it, there's just a lot more that you could do with that compared to just a duplex. Now, granted, Will got a duplex in a very prime area, so that's okay. Yeah, but I, I would either go for like, you know, something like that, right? If you're going to go for the lower door count for that house hack, then maybe getting something in a prime area that, you know, that compared to, like I was just saying with the fourplex, it maybe might need to be not as prime of an area, but uh, it's a, maybe it's adjacent to an area that's improving quite a lot. Um, and then, you know, just on the refinance and the raise of the rents and the multiple units, I think all that just compounds. And I've seen the numbers that on your first, on your house hack, if it's a fourplex and it's a big enough unit, I mean, essentially you could be cash flowing on your very, even with, high leverage such as low down payment loan on that too so i, I would recommend that you really look at as biggest the biggest nicest fourplex that you could find that's okay i like it and ben what, what he means by that is like like remember some of these fourplexes that you're going to find are going to be all under one roof right yeah. whereas some of the fourplexes might be four separate structures with a garage underneath each one some are going to be the four garage in the back with a unit on top and you know so like and and i like Trust me, I was looking for these fourplexes in LA. Like Alex said, like you can qualify for that maximum number, the maximum leverage on a single family versus a fourplex. 
it goes from like 700,000 to like 1.2 million out here in Los Angeles County, yeah. right? Um, so it's like, it's significantly higher leverage. And so if you can qualify for that, like Alex mentioned, like go big, like go. Yeah, I mean, it, I think that's a big, a big challenge that you're like going to borrow a million bucks or like something like that. But guys, like I'm in debt, like, like three, four million bucks, like $3 million, but I have a lot of equity too. So um, it's not like, I think it's dead. seven, You're closer to maybe five, six or seven, but uh, yeah, this guy over here, Will keeps putting me more and more in debt. Like it's his job <laughs> is to make sure that I get him more debt. But um, I think that's a big, um, I guess, hurdle uh, in your mind to be like, okay, I'm going to borrow, like, instead of me borrowing half a million, I'm going to borrow a million, like, ooh, like, that's, that's, you got to wrap your hands around that. So, sure. just, but if you, if it's for a purpose and you know, that's going to be good, good debt at a low rate, I mean, it's not, not reckless. It's very intelligent. Yeah. Makes sense. Appreciate remember, it, guys. When you go to re-rent it, that superior unit is going to, is going to, you know, get superior rent, right? So that yeah. will help you on your loan. So although it seems, you know, scary, it seems like, oh my God, I'm taking out a million dollar loan. It's like, yeah, but I also have, you know, three really superior, you know, rental properties and I'm going to be living in one of them. And, and that makes four. So that, you know, that's something to keep in mind as well. Yep. Gotcha. I just want to add to that. It's just, you know, crunch your numbers to make sure what your income is and your expenses are. So how much you have to cover after. Sure. Yeah, that's huge. On a fourplex, like, are you paying sewage and water? Cause that's going to be a little bit more than on a, on a duplex, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool guys. Anybody else with a big win? And again, Ben, congratulations. Like that's a, a huge win. Congrats uh, again on that, uh, on that second acquisition there. That's huge. Yep. Big win. Anyone else with any big wins? I know Antonio, we got to meet up last week up at the, uh, the house. That was pretty cool getting to see the, uh, the property. I think we're going to do a meetup that we're going to probably announce yeah. tomorrow or the next day at that house. So for those of you that, you know, had the opportunity to see the house up in Sun Valley, uh, we did a meet up there, had about 40, 50 people come out. And, and I think we're going to do a follow up on that so that you guys can see the finished product. And uh, we'll have Amari there, our project manager, who's an absolute killer. Uh, I've been myself over there. So we'll actually kind of dive into some specific numbers, why we chose certain rehabs versus other rehabs and and uh, give you guys an idea on that. So that that's a big win. I thought uh, for you, Antonio, it was cool to get to see you up there at the house. Yeah, man, it's it's a totally different house now. It's beautiful. It's a home. Yeah. Now it's yeah. a home. Yeah. It's Pretty clean. Proud of that property. <clears throat> and guys, I mean, you know, you guys, you can hit us up. Like if, if I'm ever in town, like if I'm in Los Angeles and you ever want to come see one of our houses, like shoot me a call, say, Hey, Will, what are you doing today? Like, you know, I want to come see this house. I want to come, you know, get an idea of it. I'll be at my house hack for the next, you know, two, three months working, working out of there while, while they're doing the day, I'll be on my laptop in the back. So if anybody ever wants to come down and, you know, get a, a look at that house hack, get a look at the numbers, why we chose it, why I did certain things like, you know, be open about it. Cause Antonio reached out and uh, mm -hmm. we were there and he was there and uh, you know, it was a good opportunity for him. Awesome. Awesome guys. I think we're wrapping things up here. If anybody has any uh, final questions or comments or big wins or goals they want to share for the year. I got a win, Alex. <laughs> What's up, my man, Rod? What's up guys. I, my name is Roderick. I know it says Karen on my thing. It was her link. But uh, yeah, I got, we just entered escrow in for a threeplex in Daytona Beach, Florida, which is where my daughter lives. So we're getting ready to start that whole process and we're hoping to Airbnb one of the units so we have a place to stay when we go out there and dabble with that. So if anybody has contacts in and around that area, love to talk to you guys and connect we're we're kind of focusing on tampa to orlando and that whole like zone because it's just blowing up right now yeah so. yeah it is so where is that located where is uh daytona beach located in, it's in between uh tampa and miami it is not is it is on oh, the north. beach yeah just a little bit up from orlando gotcha, gotcha. but that awesome. whole, like, what, what are the numbers look like on that deal just kind of curious uh so we're purchasing at 340 um, it's a three bedroom, two bath house in the front and then two, one bedroom, one bath units in the back. So after rehab and everything will be like just under the 1% rule. How, how but, did you finance or fund it? Uh, conventional financing, 20% down. We'll see. Um, went straight to the seller. So found it awesome, on. Awesome, dude. Congrats, on, Rod. Congrats. A nice address. It's pretty far from Hawaii, huh? A lot of times, big time zones. Time zone difference there. 
It is. It is. But if anybody else wants to talk about Florida, man, hit me up or Oahu too. I'm here if you guys need help. So definitely. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, man. Congrats um, on the win, bro. That's huge. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a fan of Florida. I, I know a couple of people are investing in Tampa. Um, and I know a bunch of investors in uh, Florida, but I just think it's, it's a bit of a, it's just too, too far east for me right now. I, I want to keep the investing a little bit closer to the West Coast, um, but I'm not opposed to having something in South Florida because it's definitely a cool place, a great market. Um, cool, man. Well, you guys, I think it's been here an hour. It, it, um, great hanging with you. I'll be in LA, to, or I'm sorry, I'll be in Vegas uh, next uh, tomorrow, and I will be in LA in a couple of weeks in February. Um, but go get some deals. Let's make some money. See you guys on the flip side. Hey, Alex, are you guys doing any uh, live meetups by any chance on the weekends? Uh, we're going to be doing a live meetup in February uh, in L.A. at that big warehouse we did last time. Uh, I think Scott came out. A couple of yep. people came out. Andy was there for sure. So we'll be doing something like that, something in the middle of February, it looks like. So, I, I mean, I imagine it would be about 100 people plus. It was like, like it was last time. So. Come on out, brother. And then we have one coming up next Tuesday. It's Tuesday night. So it'll be like a 6.30, um, probably like 5.30, 6.30 until 7.30, 8.30. And we're going to probably get a little fire pit in the backyard um, and some hot chocolate and stuff. And, and you know, you guys can come all out and, and hang out by the fire. And um, it's a beautiful backyard there at the house that, that we just re recently re finished. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll stay warm and, uh, you know, go in and out of the house and kind of get some ideas of the, the rehab. And uh, that'll be this Tuesday. So I'll, I'll send out a flyer for that here in the next couple of days. Sweet. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Cool, guys. Right, guys. We'll catch you on the flip side. All right. Let's go.